The mountains to the north lay sunrise in the corrugated folds, and the days were cool, and the nights were cold, and they sat about the fire, each in its rounds of darkness, in that round of dark, while the idiot watched from the cage at the edge of the light. The judge cracked with the back of an axe the shinbo of an antelope, and the hot marrow drip on the smoking on the stones. They watched him. The subject was war. The good book says that he lives by the sword, shall perish by the sword, said the black. The judge smiled, his face shining with grease. What right man would have it any other way, he said. The good book does indeed count war and evil, said Irving. Yet, there's many a bloody tale of war inside it. It make no difference what men think of war, said the judge. War endures. As well as the men what they think of stone. War was always here. Before man was. War waited for him. The ultimate trade. Waiting his ultimate practitioner. That is the way it was and will be. That way. And not some other way. He turned to Brown from whom he heard some whispered slur demur. Ah, Davy, he said. It's your own trade we honor here. Why not rather take a small bow? Let's each acknowledge each. My trade? Certainly. What is my trade? War. War is your trade, is it not? Ain't it yours? Mine too. Very much so. What about all the notebooks and bones and stuff? All other trades contained in that war. Is that why war endures? No. It endures because young men love it, and old men love it in them. Those that fought, those that did not. That's your notion. The judge smiled. Men are born from games, nothing else. Every child knows that play is nobler than work. He knows too that the worth or merit of a game is not inherent in the game itself, but rather in the value of that with which is put at hazard. Games of chance requires a wager to have into meaning at all. Games of sports involve the skill and strength of the opponents and the humiliation of defeat and the pride of victory are themselves sufficient stakes because they inhere in the worth of the principles and define them. But the trial of chance or trial of worth all the games expired to the condition of war, for here that which is wager swallows up game and players all. Suppose two men at cards with nothing to wager save their lives, who has not heard such a tale. A turn of a card, the whole universe for such a player has labor clinking to this moment, which will tell if he's to die at the man's hand or that man at his heads. What's more certain than the validation of a man's worth could there be? The enhancement of the game to its ultimate state admits no argument concerning the notion of faith. The selection of one man over another is a preference absolute and irrevocable. It is, a, is indeed a dulled man who could have reckoned so profound a decision without agency or significance of either one. In such games have for their stake the annihilation of the defeated, the decisions are quite clear. This man holds this particular arrangement of cards in his hands, is thereby removed from existence. This is the nature of war, whose stake is at once the game and the authority and the justification. Seeing so, war is the truest form of divination. It's a testing of one's will and the will of another, within, within that a larger will, which because it binds them, is therefore forced to select. War is the ultimate game, because war is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. War is God. Brown studied the judge. You're crazy, Holden. Crazy at last. The judge smiled. Mike does not make right, said Irving. The man that wins in some combat is not vindicated morally. Moral law 
is an invention of mankind for the disenfranchisement of the powerful in favor of the weak. Historical law subverts it at every turn. A moral view can never be proven right or wrong by any ultimate test. A man falling dead in the duel is not thought, thought thereby to prove it in error as to his views. His every involvement in such a trial gives evidence of a new and broader view. The willingness of the principles to forego a further argument as, tri as triviality, which is in fact, is and to petition directly the chambers of historical absolute and clearly indicates how little of the moment are the opinions and what great moment of the divergences are there for. For the argument is indeed trivial, but not to separate the wills thereby manifest. Man's vanity may well approach the infinite in capacity, but his knowledge remains imperfect, and however much he comes to value his judgment, ultimately he must submit them before a higher court. Here there can be no special pleading. Here are consideration of equity and, ec and rectitude and more right render void without warrant, and here are the views of the litigant despised. Decisions of life and death, of what shall be and shall not, beggars all the questions of right. In the elections of these magnitudes, or lesser ones, assume moral, spiritual, natural. The judge search out for the circle for disputants. But what say the priest, he said. Tobin look up. The priest does not say. The priest does not say, said the judge. But what the priest has said, for the priest has put the robes of his crafts and taken up the tools of a higher calling, which all men honor, the priest also will be no god server but a god himself. Tobin shook his head. You have a blasphemous tongue, Holden. In truth, I was never a priest, but only an initiate to the order. Journeyman priest or apprentice priest, said the judge, men of God and men of war have strange affinities. I'll not second say you in your notion, said Tobin. Don't ask it. Ah, priest, said the judge. What could I ask of you that you are not already given?